I was just beginning to do therapy and see patients or clients or customers. I use the word patients. And um, it occurred to me that a lot of the people I was seeing were having trouble because of stuff going on at work. I didn't quite understand, but what was becoming very clear to me, really clear fast, because I was dealing with vets coming out of Afghanistan and Somalia and the theater of action. And what was very clear to me, painfully clear, was that I was observing a symptomology among people who came out of the workplace that looked a lot like PTSD. And I couldn't separate it from the symptomology of people who were coming out of a war zone. Do you understand me? I couldn't separate them out, and I didn't get it. Thomas Saz came for the day to give us a talk, and he was talking about the impact of work in people's lives. He said, nobody, not you, not me, not you, not you, no one escapes the impact of eight hours a day, five days a week. So we give him a little time, right? Seven and three quarters a day, whatever. Nobody walks away from the impact of that much time spent in an environment. Nobody. If that environment does not treat you with dignity, is not mindful and respectful, that doesn't mean doesn't deal with performance management issues. That's another issue. But you got to do it nice. You got to be gracious and dignified. It's not what you got to say as much as it is how you say it. He said, if that environment is battering, M's a hard word, use it. Use it. If that environment is battering, unappreciative, and negative, you will walk away from that environment battered, unappreciative, and negative. It will shape you if you are not terribly careful, and even then you're at risk. But if that environment is positive, appreciative, and caring, you will walk away a person with those characteristics. And it doesn't matter who you are. All of you will be impacted. So that kind of explained to me the scope of the impact. It is nobody escaped it. We're starting to make sense. But I didn't understand why it was such a big impact. Sigmund Freud. Sigmund Freud is a very smart man. And he said some really bright things. In fact... He said something that permitted me to understand the depth of the impact that psychological harassment has on people. He said this, take it home, teach your children. He said this, there were two things that human beings need to be happy to. The first thing you had to do was be loved. And then he said, learn how to love. Be loved and learn how to love or learn how to be lovable so that you can be loved. We need to learn how to love and learn how to be loved. I thought that makes sense to me. And then he said the second thing. The second thing was we had to learn how to earn our own keep. And I thought, what's that about? Or learn how to work. I said, what's that about? And I read the next paragraph, and it said this. It says, because in earning our own keep effectively in our community, we by definition make a contribution to that community. Yes? I do something valuable. And because I do something valuable, you look upon me as someone that you should take care of. Yes? Someone we appreciate, we recognize as valuable. That when they slip, you reach out to shoulder them, yes? Because you need them. What do all of us want to feel like? How important, how devastating is it to be pushed out of the circle? What this told me was that there is a profound importance, profoundly important for human beings to feel like they are valued, to feel like they belong. Not like they're kings, not like they walk on water. We just need to feel like we have a place. We are respected and appreciated. If you're with someone and you don't respect them and appreciate them, for God's sake, send them away before you suck the soul out of them. 
If you're going to be with someone, don't batter them. I don't know the difference in impact between a child that's been physically abused and one that's been emotionally abused. Do you? I don't. It's a misery. Because of these things, I thought it was critical. Because back then, 20, 25 years ago, it became really clear to me that the physical hazards in our environment, when they impacted on us, drove physical dysfunction. And if you were sick long enough, you got depressed and anxious. And when you got depressed and anxious, you engaged in behavior that wasn't effective, so you had behavioral dysfunction. But what became profoundly clear to me was that there are psychological hazards in our workplace, and when they impact upon us, they have precisely the same sequela of results. There is no difference when you are stressed out, feeling worthless and not good enough and suffering PTSD, the upshot of any chronic stress process is physical dysfunction, yes? From heart attack to ulcers to colitis to eczema to a whole bunch of them. And the sequela of that is behavioral dysfunction. There is no difference, none. Because of that reality, it is critical that we play with this agenda as seriously as any other health and safety agenda. I fear we're not there yet. We have some work to do. We haven't listed the psychosocial hazards in our workplace. Yes, we all go to Wemyss. Why? Because Wemyss is easy. What about the psychosocial hazards? And how do we audit for them? Maybe even before that, however, it's an issue of moral decency, right? Which of you will stand around and watch people be hit upon and do nothing? We need to deal with this because we know that psychological harassment precedes physical violence, correct? If my voice is not heard and they keep at it, what's going to happen? What do you know is going to happen? People say to me in a workplace, who could have predicted such a thing? And my answer is, you could have. And you walked by it. You walked by someone that was being teased and battered and abused, and one day they got up with a gun, and guess what they did? And people say, oh, what kind of human being would do that? Here's what I know. You ever had somebody do this to you when they're talking to you? Does it just drive your blood pressure up a little bit? A tiny bit. Mm -hmm. What does it do to everybody else that's watching? They go, oh, man, this isn't going well. It's going to be trouble here. Huh? So you say to that person, because we use our voice, huh? we say, please don't do that. And they keep doing it. Huh? And you say, please don't do that. And you move the hand aside gently. And then they do it again. Then you grab their finger and you bend it a little bit till it goes pop. And then you're the bad guy, yes? Yeah, you are. You shouldn't do that. But the bottom line is we need to be in an environment where that kind of behavior that is inappropriate is managed. Someone needs to hear when we say, this is not okay. And if they don't, that will happen. Why do we need to deal with it? Because that's been happening. And what that means is that we have to come together to work. We have to come together to get the job done. And we're committed to doing that. Meeting the mandate matters for every one of you, yes? We need to be left to do the job because it matters. And we can't do the job if we don't have an environment where we have subject matter expertise with emotionally intelligent people that are respectful. And we need all to be able to work in a psychologically healthy and safe environment that will give us an intellectually engaged environment and a better capacity to meet the mandate. Why respectful workplace? Because it's the law. It comes to us from a converging number of places. From human rights legislation, unions, Canada Labor Code, the provincial codes. It comes to us from a bunch of places. It's the law. Most of you work as stewards. You work as people that are responsible for implementing. That's a tough job. <laughs> It's also an incredibly important job. But I, what I will tell you is, it's not just your job. 
psychological harassment, in my mind, falls directly under health and safety obligations. Canada Labor Code doesn't say safe and healthy workplace free from physical hazards. It's not what it says. It says free from hazards, physical or psychological. It doesn't need to be rewritten. Psychological hazards give people not a bad hair day, they devastate them. They damage people. It is not okay. It is as damaging as a toxic gas coming from that pipe. And when there's a toxic gas coming from that pipe, what do you get to do? You get to leave, yes? You get to withhold services. I don't care where the toxic is coming from, do you? I worked at the federal government one day. They put an eight and a half by 11 sheet up for the boss that says, if you come in here, we're all leaving. Call your boss. He didn't come in that morning. He called his boss. He said, what the hell's going on? Boss said, I don't know, but they ain't working with you anymore. We have a problem, huh? Now that takes a little, it takes some, uh, it takes a little intestinal fortitude will be the good word I'm looking for. I don't know what we do in life that matters that doesn't take a little guts. Do you? It matters. We take a little guts. There's a risk. For sure there is. Less now than there has ever been. It's not about having a bad hair day, folks. It's about workplace violence. People are petitioning to, having, to have the Canada Labor Code corrected. It doesn't really need to be corrected, but they are. For three reasons. Here are the three reasons. Because the code is actually pretty clear, huh? in terms of its regulations particularly. Code is a narrative. The regulations come out of court cases. It's very clear around psychological harassment. Word psychological harassment's not in the code. People want it in the code for three reasons. Because they want to be sure that we get that psychological harassment or bullying, disrespectfulness, is critical. It's not a bad hair day. It's not because you're a little sensitive. He didn't beat you that hard. You're just fragile. How offensive is that one, huh? He didn't beat you that hard. It's really not wife abuse. I got some news for you. Psychological hazards, psychological harassment has to be focused on. A single institute constitutes harassment. Yes or no? We've got some provincial labor codes that are messing around with it. There's got to be a pattern of, unless the first time it occurs, it's egregious, like he really beat you hard the first time. Are you there? Don't forget the analogy. Be offended by it, and don't let anyone tell you the first time they cuss you out, it's not psychological harassment. They're wrong, it is. And it should be dealt with. First time, I'm with you, let's deal with it that way. There's a little thing called progressive discipline that permits us to say, we will deal with it first time, yes? Don't throw people under the bus. Remember my little kid? He needed some help. But we had to contain his behavior. Sure as hell we did, yes? First time. Single institutes constitutes harassment. And then they said this third thing. This comes to shoulder you in your effort to defend people that are being treated poorly. It shoulders you because it says this. Anyone that witnesses is responsible for reporting, yes? It is said that there are three great lessons from the Holocaust, the Shoah. The great catastrophe. Three great lessons. One, two, three, that's it, that's all. The first one is that you should never, you should never be a victim. The second is that you should never be a perpetrator. Never be a perpetrator. And the third, the most important of all, was that you should never be a bystander. Somebody said to me, what exactly is bullying? It's very complex to define. I said, I'm not sure it's that complex to define. Here's what I know for sure. We have lists, great lists of things, right? Excluded from social process, overloaded with work, promotion or training, frequently criticized, not critiqued. What's the difference? Criticizing is destructive. Critiquing is to offer a solution with good heart, prop nicely. 
People make unfounding comments about your job security. Gossiping. Somewhere along the line, gossiping is bullying. Shouting. You got people that shout at you in your workplace? All over. Don't care what they're shouting about unless it's a truck coming down the street that's going to hit you. Yes or no? We don't get to shout at people unless it's purposeful to save or protect or to communicate. We don't. People need to get that. I have lists. Temper tantrums. Body language, public criticism, name calling. Here's what I know most. People say to me, I feel like I've been bullied. That's generally good enough for me, right? Because here's what I know. If you're feeling resentful or angry or excluded, depressed, diminished, or grieved or uncared for, should we be cared for at work? Yes, we should. Should we pretend we're best friends? No, we shouldn't. We've got enough dishonesty going around. We're working colleagues. But that means we should care. If you're feeling that that's not happening, probably it's not. Probably you are being bullied. Trust your feelings, right? That's what we need to tell people. When you think that wasn't right, probably it wasn't. Sometimes we're a little overly sensitive, but not that often. I define bullying like this. Any behavior that is belittling, demeaning, intimidating, it scares you, makes you feel threatened, and catch the last one, destabilizing. It makes you less, I talk about intellectual destabilizing. You're scared and your frontal lobe flips. You can't do your work as well, you can't process as well, you don't sleep as well, you make more mistakes, now they fire you, it's called constructive dismissal. Nice, eh? You need to get it. Bullying results in that point in the sequence. Someone becoming intellectually destabilized, can't do the work as well, can't process things as well. Mobbing is what we call it when it happens with a bunch of people implicated. How do you define bullying? Here's my test. If somebody comes to me when I'm doing a workplace audit on an investigation and says, was this behavior bullying? Was it demeaning? Not did the target think she was hit hard enough. That's not the question. Question is, was that behavior, the behavior is what defines the breach of labor law and policy, not the damn reaction on part of the target. Even if the target says, no, no, it was okay. Do you know how many abused women I've worked with that don't want to? Please don't say anything. Because they've been battered and we don't go there. It is about the behavior. So you take the behavior, if you determine that it occurred, and you're not sure it's intimidating, demeaning, belittling to the average person, what do you do? You go to seven, or eight. I usually choose 10 because it makes for easy mathematics. I go to 10 people and I say, if this behavior occurred in the workplace, would you as a colleague feel diminished, belittled, demeaned, destabilized, intimidated? And if eight out of 10 tell me, yep, we would, that's called an objective definition, yes? It is not a subjective definition. Subjective is if you ask me and I tell you. It's called an inter-observer reliability. And if the majority of people say that would destabilize me, that would hurt me, that would destabilize my team, then we need to fix it, don't we? We need to go deal with it. So that's the quickest way. We now talk about workplace harassment, including sexual harassment and psychological harassment. I don't know much behavior that we used to call disrespectful that isn't, in fact, psychological harassment or an attempt to intimidate. So that yellow bar just slid right across, and it falls under labor law and organizational policy. The critical part is that it falls under labor law, yes? I like organizational policies, but here's what I know. It is the labor law that has teeth, and it is the labor law that protects us when the policy is askew. We need to know that labor law, and we need to push that button. They want to play with policy, I'm good with policy. But if the policy is not consonant, now we're done. We've got to go somewhere else. Somebody said to me, is once enough to call it bullying? My response is, lying is lying. Yes? Rape is rape. Yes? Abuse is abuse. Bullying is bullying. The first time, the second time, and the last time. Bullying is bullying, period. 
how we deal with it first time, second time, third time, might be the result of a process of progressive discipline. Why? Because we understand what's going on. This person has some problems. We need to give them a chance to deal with it because that's who we, that's who we are, yes? I don't believe the people that are bullied are victims. I think we need to be really careful because if I let them be victims, I can say things like, well, you know, they have a victim mentality. That means what? Or they don't defend themselves. So if you're little and weak, I can punch you out? Even when I was a little boy, many years ago, we were taught, pick on someone your own. It wasn't because they were victimizable. That's about who they were, that we got to behave that way, yes? I don't care what your sister did. I don't care if she doesn't know how to defend herself. I don't, you do not get to target her with your bad behavior, correct? I talk about targets, of a perpetrator, holy baby, a perpetrator. Yep, perpetrators of child abuse, perpetrators of pedophilia, perpetrators of sexual assault, perpetrators of psychological harassment. Why have you not been listening? The damage inflicted by those persons is dazzling. And the word fits. I talk about a target and I talk about a perpetrator. If you want to change behavior, there's three things you got to do. You got to notice you got a problem, yes? You got to find and make a statement of the corrective and appropriate behavior. And then you got to consecrate the appropriate behavior and the inappropriate behavior. You guys seeing signs about psychological harassment and values? Me too. That's stage two. What's the third stage? When appropriate behavior occurs, we note it. We note the people in the toughest and hardest situations that don't lose their shit because they're emotionally intelligent and they remain respectful and we note the people that can't, and we reach out, we contain their behavior, and we try and help them in a process of progressive discipline. And if we can't or they don't want to be helped, they need to be out of the workplace, correct? Because they are toxic. Nicely, graciously, kindly, and with compassion, damn it, because that's who we are. But we are also not individuals who will be rolled over by someone who does not know how or cannot manage themselves. With sympathy, you can't be here. Yes or no? It has become, it is a critical issue. What happens if the target doesn't mind? Oh, please, it's okay, don't say anything. Well, we touched on that one already. It's not about how the target feels. It's about whether or not that person stole the money. It's a breach of financial policy, yes? It's not about the target feels, it's about whether or not that person in their behavior breached the policy, yes? If they did, we deal with the perpetrator. It doesn't take care of the target, but she can't say, no, it's okay if he stole the money. No, it's okay if he breached that policy, but it's not okay if he breaches that one. So hang on a second, I've got to breach a policy here, let's deal with that. We don't get to dump it on the target. Well, you're just a little sensitive. So what the hell's that got to do with that guy's behavior? If I'm just a little sensitive, he gets to victimize? Whoops, we're back at that word. Your sensitivity, the target sensitivity, has nothing to do with the inappropriateness or appropriateness of that behavior. Yes or no? That's where we need to go. All the time, every time. What happens if the perpetrator didn't really mean it? It's an interesting question. We have something called progressive discipline. The first time they do it, we chat with them. They say, I didn't mean it. it doesn't matter. Let's not go to intent. It doesn't matter. What matters is that I help you understand you can't behave that way again. Here are the behaviors that were inappropriate. You can't do it again. If you're having a little trouble managing things, can I help you? Maybe a little EAP. Maybe we can do some stuff to help you stay within the boundaries of inappropriate behavior. The second time, we might say, you know, putting a note to file here. You can't do that, we've talked about. The third time, I don't care about intent anymore, right? Because they're damaging people and disrupting team process, correct? And they need some help. And if I just let it go on and go on, my 12 year old becomes 40. He's single, you see, because two wives have left him with all three of his children. And at 70, he's saddened because he's never met his grandchildren because his kids won't come around him anymore because he's a, she's a, 
somewhere along the line, we need to deal with this and not try and prove intent. Someone said to me, how big is the problem? That's how big the problem is. Mental health issues in this country cost us $51 billion. Half of those are said to be the result of psychosocial hazards in your workplace. We need to manage this. We need to learn the details of it. We need to not be sidetracked by the victim's sensitivities. And we need to remember who we are when we do this. We are decent and kind and gracious. And by God, we will not become one of them. But we will not tolerate it. As a man holding a 17-year-old baby whose wife was blown up in Paris, he said in an open letter, you will not scare me. You will not stop me. And I will not hate the next Muslim person. You will not win. We have to be in the same place. And that's why it starts with understanding, kindness, decency, and certainty that we have a right to speak to this agenda. Ladies and gentlemen, it's been a great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>